Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Nish Kumar. And I'm Coco Khan. By-elections are on the agenda this week, with both Labour and the Tories feeling the heat. Will the Tories set a new post-war record for the most seats lost by a party in a single parliament? And why has Labour got itself into a mess in Rochdale? Plus, we'll be joined by Zelda Perkins, one of the women who helped take down Harvey Weinstein. She'll tell us about her campaign to stop the use of NDAs to silence victims. Hi, Nish. So it's Valentine's Day and I'm all on my own in the studio. That's nice, isn't it? That's a nice gift. (laughs) Where where are you? Coco, I am uh, in New York. New York City. I'm in How's New that? York City, New York. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing some stand up here, and I uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, so I have unceremoniously ditched you uh, on <laughs> Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice. It's a familiar feeling to me, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing for Valentine's Day, though? By the way, we're going out for uh, for lunch and for dinner, um, and oh, nice. um, we we might go to the Metrograph. And watch Casablanca, oh, which nice. is a, a cinema Good. in the on the Lower East Side. How's the how's the stand up going down? By the way, the stand up is going down very nicely. Um, I'm also I'm doing a, a solo hour of comedy. If PSUK listeners want to come along uh, at uh, Union Hall uh, on the 21st of February uh, at 10 p.m. Um, so and the tickets are available, uh, and I'll have put the link up on all of my various social media feeds. This is what I'm doing for Valentine's Day, right? Check this out. I'm going to a feminist art exhibition. Fantastic. Yes, come on. What could be more romantic than a man coming with you to a place where you can observe 1970s posters saying that men are trash? (laughs) I think is that's real love. I think that's going to be really good. We're going to go to that and then we're going to watch uh, In the Mood for Love, which I've never seen. Oh, In the Mood for Love is great. What a treat, Coco. Well, you've really inspired me, actually, because I've been thinking that maybe I should, A, physically go to the cinema more because we're going to lose them otherwise, but also maybe I should watch some good movies. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't just always watch Jason Statham all the time. You mean you're broadening your horizons outwards from the Fast and Furious franchise? (laughs) Mate, honestly, I have watched that trailer for The Beekeeper a good five times. I just love it. It's so awful. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. Um, so that's what my I love plan. About this and then is I... they're slowly running out of jobs for Jason Statham to do in action films, <laughs> and we've reached apiarist. We've reached an, <laughs> a, an apiarist god rogue. I, I genuinely think, like, next time it's going to have to be like the Stamp Collector. <laughs> that does sound like a real film, doesn't it? The Stamp Collector. Um... His enemies will be licked. <laughs> That's quite good, actually. What about... Listen, um, let's put the call out to the, the barber, listeners. The <laughs> barber. A, a cut above the rest. No, that's rubbish. Well, um, the, the, unfortunately, Coco, what you've done is invented Sweeney Todd without the songs. <laughs> okay, all right. What about the groomer? Oh, that sounds wrong. No, I'm not no, going to no, say the no, groomer. So you could say it's a no, close shave, but actually there's too no, many offensive connotations no, for that A film one. called The Groomer <laughs> is about a paedophile. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I was about to uh, say uh, if listeners want to make posters for these movies, that'd be great. But now you've said the (laughs) groomer, I don't don't want listeners to make a fake movie poster for the Jason Statham film, The Groomer. Okay. Okay. What about this? The comedian, he'll get the last laugh. Again, I think you've invented the film (laughs) Joker. (laughs) Okay. So basically what I've learned from this is that all the films are done. They've all been done. What about this? Uh, this guy's a violinist who uh, only plays for children and it's called The Kiddie Fiddler. <laughs> Fucking hell, Nick. <laughs> That's, yeah, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> so grim. This was supposed to be a bad week for for the Conservative Party and for Rishi Sunak and a gift for the Labour Party. The double whammy of bad economic news 
and two potential by-election defeats, was expected to leave a wounded prime minister at the mercy of Tory plotters. And it may still play out that way. Although inflation defied predictions by staying unchanged, by the time you hear this, the latest GDP figures could mean that we're officially in recession. And the Tories themselves are predicting that despite having big majorities, both this week's by-elections in Wellingborough and Kingswood could be lost. But it's not Sunak, but Keir Starmer, who's been feeling the heat so far this week, having to suspend two parliamentary candidates for comments they've made about Israel. Yes, so Westminster News this week has mostly been dominated by the fallout from comments made by Azhar Ali. That's Labour's candidate for the Rochdale by-election, which takes place in two weeks. The Mail on Sunday reported that Mr Ali had claimed in a local party meeting last autumn that Israel had allowed the 7th of October attacks by Hamas as a pretext to invade Gaza. He issued an immediate apology and the Labour leadership seemed to be standing by him with front benchers dispatched to defend him. By Monday night, though, the tide had turned following reporting of more of his comments in the Daily Mail and Labour eventually withdrew its support for Azhar Ali. He's been suspended from the party pending an investigation, but he will still be listed as the Labour candidate on the ballot paper in Rochdale because under electoral law, it's too late to replace him. Keir Starmer has said he's taken a tough but necessary decision. Information came to light over the weekend in relation to the candidate. There was a fulsome apology Further information came to light yesterday calling for decisive action. So I took decisive action. It is a huge thing to withdraw support for a Labour candidate during the course of a by-election. It's a tough decision, a necessary decision. But when I say the Labour Party has changed under my leadership, I mean it. However, any sense that damage limitation might have been successful lasted less than 24 hours. On Tuesday night, it emerged that more recordings from the same meeting, which was with a group of Labour councillors threatening to quit the party over its stance on Gaza, show Graham Jones, the Labour candidate for Hindburn, using the words fucking Israel and saying British people who fight in the Israel Defence Forces should be locked up. Mr Jones was immediately suspended by the party and is now facing an investigation. The Jewish Labour movement say it's not been Labour's finest hour in what should have been a bad week for the Tories, Labour have somehow managed to steal defeat from the jaws of victory, Coco. I know. I wouldn't be surprised if the Tories call an election now. This is like as good as it's going to get for them. Do you know yeah, what I mean? It like, it's like been that. a disaster for Labour. So one of the things that I found quite interesting in terms of this story is, you know, there's been this ongoing conversation about factionalism within the Labour Party. And people have pointed out that, you know, other MPs who did less were punished quicker. And as our Ali is closer to the leadership, he's closer in terms of his uh, political opinions. Um, he's also been a, a strong ally in the fight against anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. So why did it take Starmer so long? I think that is a question that does need to be answered at some point. Perhaps it won't make a difference to the by-elections, but I think for Labour voters, it might be a question that they want to understand. They want clarity over the policy and they want to make sure that the party is running fairly. Yeah, um, Martin Ford, uh, the KC who was commissioned by Keir Starmer to investigate allegations of bullying, racism and sexism, has been very damning this week about the Labour Party's handling of the Azhar Ali case. And he, he went as far as calling it shambolic. And he also said uh, this on Radio Force Today programme, one does have to question how such individuals are selected in the first place and also the disparity in treatment because one of the things that concerned us when we talked about weaponisation was certainly the perception that anti-Semitism was along factional lines. If the Labour Party is serious about stamping out anti-Semitism, it can't be a case that it's only being tough on people it disagrees with in other areas of politics. You know, the principle is the principle. It can't be used to punish separate factions of the Labour Party. I also think the other serious issue here is Keir Starmer is kind of staking his claim purely on competence. You know, we've seen rowing back on all sorts of pledges, um, the green investment, the £28 billion figure, that's been sort of essentially withdrawn by the party. And when all you're offering is competence, you cannot afford slip ups like this. Starmer's working on a bomb proof manifesto. There is a sense that he is playing it safe politically and he is following the idea that you never interrupt your enemy while they're in the process of making a mistake. But if you're offering people nothing other than competence, you have to be very fucking competent. 
I think that's the least people can ask for, right? For me, the, my heart just goes out to the people of Rochdale right now on their ballot. They've got Azar Ali, suspended by the Labour Party, George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain, also a former Labour MP who was expelled from the party, Simon Danchuk for reform, who was Rochdale's Labour MP between 2010 and 2017, but was then suspended and resigned after being found to have sent explicit messages to a 17-year-old girl. Oh, my God. I mean, what are these options? And to make matters more farcical, uh, last week, the Green Party candidate, Guy Otten, withdrew from the Rochdale race after the resurfacing of what he described as his regrettable social media remarks about the Islamic faith and about Gaza. And yet he, too, will still be on the voting slip. Um, Just as on a, a little closing note of grossness. Uh, Journalist Michael Crick reported that the sewage pipes burst inside Labour's Rochdale campaign office over the weekend. So Labour's office literally was covered in shit. And I think it's kind of poetic. Whoever it is that's in charge of heavy handed metaphors is working (laughs) overtime at the moment. A sewage pipe bursting over the Rochdale Labour office is I think laying it on a bit thick. Yeah, do you know okay? what I mean? Like if we it was a, the, we get it. <laughs> if it was a TV show, you'd be like, mm, too much. That's far <laughs> too much. So that Rochdale by-election is happening on February 29th. But by the time this podcast is out, voters will be going to the polls to choose new MPs in two other by-elections in Wellingborough in Northamptonshire and in Kingswood in South Gloucestershire. What's happening in Rochdale is a lot. And while Wellingborough isn't quite that. It's really not far behind. The area's former Tory MP, Peter Bone, was kicked out after being found to have indecently exposed himself to an aide. The candidate the Tories have chosen to defend his majority of over 18,000 is a local councillor called Helen Harrison, and she just happens to be Peter Bone's partner. She's claimed that the Common Standards panel, which, despite his denials, found Bone guilty of the allegations, that, well, they'd got it wrong. That's her claim. I think think we um, had them in for our Villain of the week a little while ago, didn't we? Yeah, we did indeed, yeah. The by-election in Kingswood, by contrast, is a quieter affair. Um, It's only happening because of the resignation of the area's Conservative MP, Chris Skidmore. Uh, A former government net zero czar, he quit as an MP over Rishi Sunak's plan to allow more offshore oil and gas drilling. His majority at the last election was over 11,000. So an 11.4% swing is needed for Labour to win. Now, If the Tories do lose the two by-elections, it will set a new post-war record of the most seats who have been lost by Conservatives at by-elections during a single parliament. The numbers at the moment are they've currently lost seven and John Major lost eight between 1992 and 1997. So, I mean, what's astonishing about this is we're talking about majorities of 18,000 and 11,000 and there's been a huge amount of fatalism and downplaying of expectations from the Conservative Party. Um, They haven't been sending frontline ministers uh, into the constituencies to try and drum up voters. And a senior Tory has told The Guardian that defeatism has set in with the party having descended into a death spiral. I mean, if if they do lose these two by-elections, are we now in for another three weeks of the new Tories or whatever stupid group, the populist Tories or the frontline cool guy <laughs> Diet Coke drinking Tories or, you know, the the new association of conservatives for sensible, fair-minded Britain. Are they all going to start trying to stab Rishi Sodak in the back? Are we in for another three weeks of plotting and stupid fucking named groups? Well, let's finish this section with one silver lining, which is that Kingswood could foreshadow oh, a Portillo moment. I just want to tell the listeners what a pit Portillo moment is. Yeah, we should <laughs> clarify for younger <laughs> listeners. Yeah. I know, because I had M- Musty, our producer, he mentioned a Portillo moment. I had to go back and ask, uh, please don't tell anyone, but I don't know what he meant. What was that? <laughs> Michael Portillo... Conservative politician, much reviled by the general public. Weirdly, he's sort of been slightly reformed now because he does documentaries yeah. on trains or whatever. Anyway, but he's just your classic posh Tory guy. He lost his seat and everyone like cheered. And that sort of sense of, you know, giving them a bloody nose has become a Portillo moment. The televised footage of Michael Portillo losing his seat was an iconic piece of 90s British television. Conservative Party... 19,137. Twig, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,507.
as the Thatcher favourite, one of the bastards in the cabinet, as Don Major called him. He was accused of plotting last time for the leadership, is defeated by young Stephen Twigg. Newly elected Member of Parliament for the constituency. OK, but listen, we might be able to gazump it soon because apparently Kingswood is involved in some boundary changes. And so that will mean part of Kingswood will be merged into Jacob Rees Mogg's constituency. Now, imagine that Kingswood goes Labour, goes red, and then a load of those Labour voters move into Jacob Rees Mogg's seat, into his area. I mean, it could happen. We could see him lose his seat. I mean, that's if, a moment, isn't it? I mean, if Rhys Mogg loses his seat, I, I mean, I, that would be that would be cause for a national holiday. <laughs> the Horizon Post Office scandal, which saw more than 900 sub-postmasters wrongly prosecuted due to faulty software, has brought renewed attention to the use of non-disclosure agreements. The contracts, also called NDAs, were used by the post office to pay off and silence victims and hide the scale of the problems with their Horizon IT system. Last week, Post Office Minister Kevin Hollenrake said sub-postmasters who had signed an NDA should feel completely at liberty to discuss their situation with the authorities. Our guest this week is someone who has been campaigning to stop NDAs from being used to hide harm or wrongdoing. Zelda Perkins worked as film producer Harvey Weinstein's assistant at Miramax in the 1990s. Zelda's decision to break her NDA in 2017 was instrumental in bringing down Weinstein, who in 2020 was sentenced to 23 years in prison for rape and sexual assault. It's a pivotal moment in the Me Too movement, but the case also highlighted how NDAs are being used to silence victims. Zelda Perkins, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Hi. So, listen, so you're the co-founder of the campaign group Can't Buy My Silence. What are the aims? Really simple. Mm -hmm. We have two aims, change legislation and change legal regulation and mm -hmm. guidance around the use of NDAs. Obviously, along with that, we're trying to raise public awareness because they're mm -hmm. secret settlements and people aren't aware. You know, pr you will have definitely signed some. Probably all of your production team will have signed one without even realising. Um, and the NDAs that cause harm are now really coming to light. And that's been, you know, a bit of a slog because it's not a very sexy subject because mm. <laughs> um, I've been very much talking about law and changing law rather than necessarily talking about the individuals that, that use these um, agreements like Weinstein or Epstein or um, Crispin Odie, et cetera, et cetera. So as we mentioned in our introduction, NDAs have been back in the news. Let's hear exactly what the Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollenrake, said in the Commons last week. The Post Office has said, and it's our position, that no NDA should prevent somebody speaking to relevant individuals, including the members of Parliament, of course. Um, and it is the case, whatever, whatever part of our system and wherever an NDA is signed, it is very clear that none of them can ever prevent somebody from speaking out about a crime, going to the police, for example, or other authorities, an NDA cannot prevent somebody from doing that in any circumstance. It was weird hearing him say, oh, an NDA can't stop someone reporting a crime, because you think, well, of course not. Yeah, that was a really juicy clip, because that's actually a real, that's the real nub of the problem. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, yes, an NDA shouldn't be able to stop somebody from reporting a crime. Not everybody knows exactly what the parameters are around the crime and they can't find out if they've signed an NDA. Um, the other thing is, it's very key. He didn't say that people can break their NDAs there. He said you can talk to the relevant people so you can make a protected disclosure to your MP or to the police, but he didn't say you could break your NDA. Um, well, that's I mean, pretty key. Is... That's such a key distinction, right? <laughs> yeah, massively key distinction. In the same way as Dominic Raab has several NDAs, which which is in the public domain, and he was actually asked about this on the floor in the house in the House of Commons, and he said, "No, no, 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 I don't have any NDAs. I just have a standard confidentiality agreement." They are the same thing. Right. right, okay. All that an NDA is, is any form of agreement that has confidentiality provisions in it that stop you from discussing something that has happened to you. Mm -hmm. 
NDAs don't necessarily have non-disclosure agreement written on top of them. Mine wasn't didn't have NDA written on it. Mine was a was a damages agreement. Was okay. a you know was a settlement agreement. Now the majority of settlements that you see that have are hidden by by NDAs are not like mine. Mm. Mine was huge, and the reason mine was huge was because in my naivety at twenty five, which is when this happened, you know I had no idea. I'd never yeah, even spoken to a lawyer in my life before, and I thought. If there is a huge amount of money on this agreement, it is showing, it's indicative of the crime. Why would, you know, Miramax or Harvey Weinstein pay these two girls £125,000, and we're talking about back in the 90s, each for something that didn't happen? Mm. You thought at the time it was almost an admission of guilt? Totally, totally. And also to me, it was indicative of the crime. It was really important because our lawyers said to us, okay, you can't go to court. I mean, you can go to court, but you're not going to win. Your lives will be ruined if you go to court. And this is the reality. This is what happened to the post office workers. This is what happens when you sign an ACAS, you know, settlement and your your advisor will say, just sign it, just take the money because otherwise, you know, you're going to not get as much money The courts won't, you know, it's too expensive to go through court. It's too traumatic. You know, it is that that they think they're helping. It's not the lawyers are bad. They Mm. think they're helping. They think they're offering a panacea. They think it is the solution. Part of the reason they think it's a solution is because they don't see what happens after someone has signed an NDA. Or, you know, often a lot of the people who come to us, in fact, the majority of them say that their experience of the negotiation process is more traumatising than the actual initial misdemeanour. And then, you know, you end up signing this because you just want it to be over. You want your life to move on. You're exhausted emotionally. You're exhausted psychologically. You know, you're not allowed to talk to anybody about what's going on. You're probably not allowed to talk to your family, so you can't explain what's Mm. happening. You're concerned about your finances. You know, it's all point, all the guns are pointing at you to sign. All the pressure is on you. And so you'll give in in the end, generally. You know, most people do. And in fact, we have data that shows that 30% of people won't even report now because they they anticipate being put through an NDA and they would prefer to keep their voice and try and work out the problem themselves. So, but, so ju- you know, just so that we clarify your specific mm. background here, you, you were working for Harvey Weinstein, you experienced mm. sexual harassment but it was when a colleague told you that Weinstein had tried to rape her that you decided to take the allegations to uh, the studio, to Miramax, and then both signed NDAs in exchange for financial damages. And what you're talking about here is the pressure. As you say, you were 25, you know, and I think, was it your first job out of university? Yeah, it was my it was my first job that I kind of got by mistake. And, you know, we didn't even have the word sexual harassment. Yeah. That was just normal workplace behaviour. Yeah. We all know, well, particularly us as women, that in the workplace there is always somebody, when you start a job, someone will say, oh, don't go in the photocopy room with Kev, you know. <laughs> Handsy you know, Kev. Handsy Kev. Yeah. And, and that was what it was like at Miramax in terms of, of Harvey's harassment behavior Mm -hmm. what we were scared of was his anger right um with our nda i mean we went i went i went directly to weinstein when this happened to confront him and you know took took my colleague out of the equation but when i actually went and he denied it but when i actually went to my senior to report what had happened it was not escalated she just said get yourself a good lawyer Oh, God. And so I presume that meant that we were going to get justice. We were going to go to court. It was going to be hell, but we were going to get justice. What I didn't understand and what I was told immediately that I spoke to lawyers, and this is, again, what happens to the majority of people who go forward with a complaint or a grievance, they get told that there isn't really, there's no point, Mm. you know, that they have no power. There's no point in going up against the big guys. Now, we're meant to be equal in the eyes of the law. And there obviously isn't equality when you're an employee and an employer. Just briefly, what was that pressure like? What sort of impact did that have on you personally? Uh, It was catastrophic. I was 25. It was my first job. I was like, oh, I'll just get another job. I hadn't really thought about it. I'm doing the right thing. You know, in the movies, when you do the right thing, everything goes your way. That's not what happened. I mean, the negotiation process itself was pretty horrifying because we were made to feel like we were the criminals for highlighting a potential rapist. 
We only were allowed to the law offices after sort of business hours, which was also quite weird and intimidating in the city. You know, we were two young girls. We had a young female pregnant um, solicitor. Mm -hmm. We were kept in a room with no windows. We weren't allowed pen and paper. We were escorted to the loo. We weren't offered refreshment. There was one occasion where we actually did an afternoon session where we were there from 12 until 4. Then we were given an hour's break where we went out and got a sandwich. And Mm -hmm. then we came back in at 5 in the afternoon and we were there till 5 in the morning. (sighs) You know, I mean, it was, it's sort of legal waterboarding. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. Um, And this is not unusual. You're put under a huge amount of time pressure. You're told the deal will be off unless you agree now. So you don't have much choice. You know, once we, once we came to a, to an agreement, and I'd like to point out that our NDA had more um, clauses in to try and stop Weinstein than we actually had ourselves. Right. You know, we thought we had, we had done pretty well in terms of trying to stop his behaviour, because that's all we were trying to do. And that's what most people who come up forward with a grievance or whistleblow are doing. They're trying to actually improve mm. and look after that workplace. You know, and it's a human right to work in a safe environment. So why whistleblowers or people who speak up are treated like criminals is, you know, is a major part of the problem. Going forward, certainly for me, um, I mean, my career was over in the film industry, which I didn't really understand until I went to a couple of job interviews, which I'm afraid were taken by men. Now, I just spent a month of my life fighting, you know, a really powerful, frightening Mm. man to try and try and stop a sexual predator. And then I had to sit there with a man asking me really about my potential sexual relationship with Harvey and whether that was going to be a good thing if they employed me or a bad thing. And I knew at that point that I wasn't going to be able to to go to Mm. (laughs) interviews because I would just, I would blow. Yeah. Um, and, um, I actually moved, I, a friend, a friend offered me a job working with horses in South America and I moved to Guatemala and I stayed there for five years. And, you know, partly that was to do with the fact was was that I couldn't speak. I couldn't tell my friends why I'd left my job. I couldn't tell my family why I'd left my job. I couldn't explain to new employers why I'd left my job. And I was very visible at Miramax. I'd been working for Harvey for four and a half years as his sort of number one, Mm. you know, little protege. Um, And, you know, this is, again, this is is what is repeated for everybody who signs these agreements. Their experience, their life is treated as IP that's taken away from them. Yes. You know, they can't speak about their trauma. Mm. The impression that we left that lawyer's office was very clear that if we spoke to the police or we spoke to a therapist or we spoke to the HMRC or we spoke to anybody ever and we weren't allowed to speak to each other again, then we would be sued and end up probably going to prison because we wouldn't have had the money to pay back. So then nearly 20 years, you sort of kept the NDA living with that on a day-to-day basis. But then in 2017, you were actually the first person to break the NDA with Weinstein. Why did you decide to do it then? Um, Well, I had broken it endlessly, actually. I mean, as you've probably already discovered, I'm not very good at not talking. (laughs) (laughs) That was why I, like, moved to Central America, because I was like, this is a disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no way I can stay in Europe or anywhere near America and not, like, get murdered by Weinstein. Oh, God. So I need to stay where it doesn't matter. No one had ever heard of Weinstein. There wasn't even a cinema in Guatemala. Just you telling the horses all about Miramax. Oh, I told everyone. Everybody. You um, can't put, no. you can't apply an NDA to a horse. You can't no, you do that. Can't. <laughs> um, but I did, I mean, I did tell, I did tell my friends, I did tell my family, I did tell people because I just felt it was so wrong. And I was like, if I tell the right people carefully who care about me and won't, won't use it against me, there's somehow right will come out, right will win. I was like, well, and it sounds dramatic now. I was like, well, do you know what? I'll take one for the team because this is so important that people understand not just about Harvey, but about the system. And everyone was jumping on the bandwagon because he was the perfect ogre. And he is an ogre, 
But also everyone's like, look at the horrible fat man, look at the horrible fat man. In, you know, don't look at me. That's what all of Hollywood was doing. Don't look at us. It's all him. Yeah, of course. Which was bullshit. They were all doing it. Everybody was doing it. Everyone's doing it in finance. Everyone's doing it everywhere where there's power because they can, because the law allows them to, because they've got this fabulous get out of jail card. Mm. Like You can't have that. You cannot have the law enabling harm. It is weird with the, I mean, this is maybe not quite related, but a couple of years ago, I did a story about the gender pay gap. So obviously we've had reporting on gender pay gap now for five, six years. It's not made a blind bit of difference. Now we all know how bad it is, but no one's been incentivized to change it. And I was trying to look into this, like what could be fixed, what could be whatever. And I just came across this random tidbit that one in five workers has a gag clause in their contract that says they cannot tell anyone how much they're being paid. Now that's not a legal thing. There's no legal wrongdoing there's no sexual assault there's no harassment but it's using silence for keeping you down keeping you in your place do you think there's any fair example of where confidentiality agreements or any of these kind of workplace policies aren't having a negative impact on the worker sure i mean listen ndas and confidentiality has its place yeah and i'm not denying that and you know i think the legal sector initially tried to just say that i was you know trying to stop non-disclosure and confidentiality. NDAs came about, you know, in Silicon Valley, in the tech industry to protect. Oh, so you can't tell anyone IP. about the iPhone 56 that you've seen. Yeah. Right. Or okay. you can't tell, you know, the, the, the recipe for Coca-Cola. Right. Client confidentiality, various things like that. You know, they have a very valuable role. And, you know, in settlement agreements or damages agreements, if the victim does not want the subject to be spoken about, just in the same way that you can have anonymity as a victim of, you know, um, sexual abuse in, 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 in law... You know, the victim can choose to have confidentiality if they so wish. What they can't do, what I don't think should be able to happen, mm. is that an alleged perpetrator can be protected. Right. Now, firms, because, you know, at the moment I'm trying to get businesses to sign up to a corporate pledge. We had a pledge with higher education, which actually to not use NDAs and not just around sexual harassment for discrimination and bullying as well, mm -hmm. because this isn't about sexual harassment. This is just about the abuse of power. Um, and that pledge, within 18 months, we managed to get converted into legislation, which is huge and we're really excited about. And I'm sort of trying to do the same thing with business. And I can't, I've only got one company, one law firm so far to sign up to this pledge. And I've approached all the top broadcasters, you know, Amazon, Google. I mean, I'm in talks with a lot of them and, and it's, it's going, but... It's amazing how difficult any of them are finding it to sign a voluntary, unenforceable pledge to say that they are not going to abuse their employees by using confidentiality to hide harm. I, I just want to pick up on something you said there, because we often talk, we talk to lots of people engaged in campaigning on this podcast, but I think it's really important to highlight that you could, like, actually you've managed to convert it into some legislation. So... Can you just talk us through that process of taking it from a campaign into actually getting it made into law? And how has it been getting the politicians engaged with this? Well, I had no knowledge. I, I, I'm woefully politically ignorant when um, I started this. And, you know, I broke my NDA and everyone was like, oh, dear, it's terrible. Yes, gosh, well done. Aren't you brilliant? And I was like, OK, great. So what are you going to do about it? Well, Theresa May, to give her her due, said, I'm going to sort this out. Then weirdly, this kind of buffoon with floppy hair got <laughs> in and like the whole country went to shit. And obviously, you know, this was an issue that he really wasn't, wasn't yeah. keen to, to, to back up. But I was very lucky because I gave evidence at two select committee inquiries and the chair of the Women in Equality Select Committee at the time was um, Maria Miller, now Dame Maria Miller, and somebody else who was on the, in the committee at the time was Jess Phillips. Now, um, I couldn't have wished really for two more brilliant women to pick me up right at the beginning of this and be my allies. And they have both been phenomenal in different ways. Um, and listen, I, I don't care who gets this through. I don't care whether it's the raving loony party, you know, I will be their friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, and both Maria 
and Jess, and then I also have a fantastic ally in Leila Moran um, in the Lib Dems, have worked so hard on this because they feel passionately about it for lots of, you know, for lots of reasons, not just because of my story. Jess and I kind of came up and, you know, and her brilliant aides came up with this um, uh, amendment for the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill on the back of an envelope on a Sunday night because Jess rang me and was like, oh my God, this is about to go go through. We should put something on in on this. Mm. I think it's also worth mentioning just to our listeners that Maria Miller is a Conservative and Jess Phillips is Labour. So we're yes. talking about cross-party so collaboration. Got, yeah, this is real cross-party and all three of them, all three of them were fighting for this you know, yes. independently and together, you know, and it really shows. And I have to say, I'm afraid the majority of MPs who have been great allies are, are, are women. Mm. They understand, I think, because women do tend to be ones who are silenced more. So this amendment was was a, was a Labour amendment. It then came, you know, through for its final um, vote in, in the House of Commons after being through the Lords and was voted through by the government. And we had a government minister standing at the dispatch box saying... NDAs are terrible. They should never be used for, you know, hiding harm. But what's fantastic is, is that this piece of legislation now is set precedent mm -hmm. and it's given us the leverage. And, you know, I've had a couple of meetings with Kevin Hollenrake to, and to give him his due, I think personally, he is very passionate and behind this. Uh, I think the party line is is where, what, what, what the problem is. Right. But um, do, what, why is that? Well, if you think about it, basically what we're doing is we're trying, to, we're disrupting the status quo. And anything that is disrupting the status quo is always going to come against, you know, big barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, NDAs, silencing the vulnerable, keeping the weak weak, keeping the poor poor is how powerful people stay in power. So we're taking away one of their number one easy, easy tools. And the current government line is that they're waiting to see how the university legislation plays out before they can move it right. into employment. Kemi Badenoch will do nothing that perceivably is harming business. Right. So right. she just needs to turn her telescope around the right way. Because you know what? Running an ethical, moral company that looks after its employers works better. Mm. They're the companies that are succeeding right now. Well, Kemi Badenoch, she's the uh, business secretary, right? So that's And what... also equality, women's equality. Yeah. <laughs> and note, I've not been to speak to her yet. Right. Oh, God. Because <laughs> I'm speaking to everyone else. Because mm. to be honest, I don't feel that there's, there's much play there. And I don't want to get shut down. Mm. Um, however, you know, in, in terms of labour, I feel like we've got a lot of movement there. Um, I, you know, I'm sure you're aware that Marina Wheeler Casey was yes. employed by the Labour Party to look at whistleblowing and protections for particularly women in the workplace mm. and sexual harassment. And she's doing this big report with Emily Thornbury. And in fact, I'm going to see them <laughs> after here. Oh, nice. Great. <laughs> For the second time, which I'm very excited about, because I think, I think, you know, they're both lawyers and I think they understand, they understand the harms here and they also understand the fix. Mm. Um, I don't want to jinx things, but I'm just going to say they're definitely going to make this into the, into a piece of legislation for the <laughs> Labour Manifesto. Because <laughs> it's free. You know, there's no money. Yeah. Mm. If and when Labour get in, there's no money for them to do anything with. So anything that's free. Yeah. Your role in bringing down Harvey Weinstein was immortalised on screen in 2022 in a film called She Said with Samantha Morton, the Queen, playing <laughs> you. So here's a clip. People have tried to write this story before. He kills it every time. Harvey adamantly denies any allegation of assault. He played people. He was a master manipulator. Will you give me just one chance to talk to you? Are you sure that this isn't just young women who want to sleep with a movie producer to try to get ahead? This is bigger than Weinstein. This is about the system protecting abusers. What was that like, seeing yourself portrayed on the big screen by none other than Samantha Morton? I mean, were you happy with how your bit was told? Um, listen, Samantha Morton is a, is, is a goddess. The and icon, it, yes. If it wasn't for her 
that whole experience um, would have been only horrific, to be honest. Mm. It was not a great experience. And it was weird because having worked in the industry, I understand what happens to a script when it goes through development. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a, it's a dramatization. So there's a lot of stuff that's not actually fact- factually accurate, which wouldn't matter if I was dead, but it kind of matters when you're alive. <laughs> um, and I know it sounds really awful, but I'm kind of glad the film wasn't wildly commercially successful. <laughs> <laughs> just, just just because it's it is a weird thing you think like the idea is really exciting that someone's going to portray you in the film the reality is actually it's not it's not it's not great mm. um also for me i know that's it not sounds... the ending you want because because this story started in the in hollywood so you yeah. sort of the ending you want is that and now hollywood is different and then actually no it's the same They're taking a story not letting you speak up all right. <laughs> it, it's weird. And I have to say, it was really hard because also I only went to one of the openings, one of the premieres, because I didn't want to go to the premieres because, you know, we had to do, we had to do the, oh, dress up in a dress and walk down the red carpet. And I'm like, do you not get it? The whole reason that all of these women were in the situation they were in, because they all fell for that shit, mm. because they yeah. all want to put on their, you know, their, holly, their dress and walk down the red carpet because they get dressed up like show ponies and do that. You know, I went in a suit with my Can't Buy My Silence t shirt on. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not playing that game because this is where it all started. And do you not see the irony? Well, good for you for doing that. Good for you. Well, you know, I, I sound like a, a, a right old, you know, Grinch, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. <laughs> One of the things that will presumably chill the listeners of this podcast, as it did me hearing you say it, is that you think that a lot of people will have signed an NDA without realising it. Is there something that people can do if they find themselves in a situation where they're being constrained by an NDA mm. from reporting on abuse? Absolutely. I mean, my first thing I would suggest that people go to our website, which is can'tbuymysilence.com. We have a huge amount of resources there to tell you what to, giving you some advice. It's not legal advice, but it is practical and real advice. And what you can do if you're being asked to sign an NDA, what you can do if you have signed an NDA. There are also great companies out there to help like protect whistleblowing, who give you whistleblowing legal advice and whistleblowers um, UK. Um, But something that I think is important for people to understand, and I'm not telling people to break their NDAs, although secretly I am. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'll save the UK is not responsible for any legal action (laughs) thank you (laughs) big disclaimer Um, is that 90% if not more of NDAs are not worth the paper they are written on Mm. they are not legally enforceable they are there to scare the living daylights out of you and keep you quiet and if you go to a lawyer a lawyer will always tell you you can't break your NDA now again I'm not advising people to break their NDAs (laughs) but in the last um 12 months, I've had uh, four people who I've been working with who chose entirely independently to break their NDAs after talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> A lot. It feels, like, it feels like you're saying one thing, Zelda, but uh, no, you're suggesting no. it's something else. <laughs> no, no, I'm not at all. I'm absolutely not. Don't break your NDA without full legal advice, whatever you do. Um <laughs> But some very um, some very smart women, um, one broke their NDAs and there have been no recriminations. Now, you know, that's a cross-section of, 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 of sectors. And actually for me, you know, one of the areas where NDAs are rife are in journalism, as I'm sure, you know, you know, and in the entertainment industry, massive. Um, and I've got lots of Russell Brand women who speak to me who've not yet broken their NDAs. Mm. Um, in fact, I, you could pretty much name anybody to me Except you, <laughs> Bish. You're safe so far. <laughs> but the sad thing is, is that I have this horrible sort of treasure chest of yeah. of of people with 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 awful stories who oh. are too afraid to come come forward, and they're not all women. Do you think so? Is this your life's work now, or are you sort life. of hoping? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you're sort of hoping like, come on, ten years and I can have a break. Ten. Breathe, <laughs> like end of this year. Okay, come on, Labour, get in. <laughs> legislation is changed. Right, right, right. Then I think I've managed to persuade the legal sector that if legislation's changed, they'll change their guidance. Then I'm done. Then I need to get a job. I haven't earned any money for. <laughs> 
for f- basically five years. It's always Guatemalan horses. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's where I'll be heading back if I can afford my ticket to get out. <laughs> that's that's such a nice nice note to end the conversation on. <laughs> Politicians, please, for the love of God, do some legislating so Zelda can get back to Guatemala and hang yeah. out with the horses. Thank you. <laughs> he's just saying that because he knows he's got an NDA. Get out of the country <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Uh, Zelda Perkins thank you so much for your time today and yeah we we are very much following this and we also hope that it will go into the manifesto if you're listening Labour you know a little suggestion from us total pleasure and thank you for shining a little bit of light on the campaign Um, and as well as going there to check for information um, there's also a donation there's also um, a uh, what that thing you sign a petition petition yeah. yes yes because all of that really helps we'll stick that in the show notes thank you so much Fantastic. lovely thank you so much Zelda we really appreciate it thank you it. so much Zelda not at all we make so much content here at Crooked and if you're not checking our YouTube channels you're leaving prime content on the table Hysteria has a series called This Fucking Guy, where they roast the men who deserve it most. Tommy Vitor has a show with Brian Tyler Cohen called Liberal Tears, with rankings and drafts on everything political. And Lovett has a new segment called What A Week, where he jokes about the early breaking news of the week. You can watch Pod Save the UK on the Pod Save the World YouTube channel. For all of this exclusive content and more, head to crooked.com forward slash videos. It's time to name our PSUK hero and villain of the week. So Coco, who's your choice for villain? Well, it was very easy this week because I had some help from one of our listeners, actually, Harriet in Kent. She sent us a voice note to tell us about three Tory councillors on Warwickshire County Council who are very deserving of our Villain of the Week award. Hi, Nish and Coco and all the Pod Save the UK team. Um, Just thought this one might interest you. Um, There was a meeting in January at Warwickshire Council and the councillors have been filmed saying some incredibly offensive and outdated views about um, children with special needs. Um, As per usual, the parenting is being blamed. Comments have been made such as, is there something in the water? They have also said, oh, well, there weren't any kids with these problems when I was at school. There were. As a parent of two very small children with additional needs, I can say safely that these comments are completely offensive and don't, I don't know what world these people are living in. It's just very concerning. These people are in charge of funding and policies that affect our children when they've clearly either never met anyone with additional needs or taken the time to actually learn anything. So if that sounded bad enough, let's actually hear it. So this is Councillor Jeff Morgan speaking at this meeting of the Council's Children and Young People Scrutiny Committee, where some of the councillors seem to be struggling to understand the rising demand for the Council's special educational needs and disabilities services. Surely it can't always be the case that just because demand is increasing, there is a genuine need. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I don't know how, how you do that apart from, I don't know, being tougher, asking more penetrating questions, not automatically accepting the plea of a mother saying that little Willie has got ADHD when in actual fact little Willie is just really badly behaved. And, and need some form of strict correction. You see where I'm going? I don't want to be too Daily Mail on this, but, but I do, th- <laughs> but I am, yeah. <laughs> so as our listener Harriet alluded to, other comments included Councillor Brian Hammersley asking if something in the water was increasing special needs cases and Councillor Claire Gulby questioning whether families were on social media and this is an actual quote, swapping tips on how to get their children diagnosed. Three councillors have apologised and are being taken off the Children and Young People Scrutiny Committee and according to the council leader are being put on a programme of training, development and education. But my God, it's it's, it's horrible to hear it in the, the cold light of day. Like We know that there's uh, stigmatising opinions about children with additional needs and that there's a long legacy of blaming the mothers. Oh, the mothers never the fathers um but to actually hear it in 2024 it took my breath away also the just the 
the assertion of, well, it wasn't like this when I was at school. I didn't know oh any people God. like that. That is I'm like, my, one of my <laughs> least favourite things. It wasn't like this. Kids weren't getting dark. Yeah, because they didn't know what it was. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, kids I didn't have, no one ever had a peanut allergy. Yeah, they did. They just used to die. And people would say it was because of ghosts. <laughs> you know, dinosaurs. Okay, so your turn now, Nish. Who are you awarding the title of PSUK Hero of the Week to? Well, look, on a much happier note, I was genuinely touched by this story about Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, who have been helping out a young Wrexham fan with a rare health condition. Um, the two actors are, of course, the owners of Wrexham Football Club and the stars of the TV documentary, Welcome to Wrexham. Wrexham fan Louis Perrin was born with a rare genetic condition. Uh, now, this condition causes him to have painful leg spasms, limited mobility, epilepsy and cerebral palsy. And his parents, Aaron and Charla, are fundraising £40,000 to adapt their home in Wrexham. And they were shocked uh, to see a £10,000 donation appear on their fundraising page last Friday with a simple message, up the town, young man, Ryan and Rob from Wrexham celebrity owners. Uh, the family that they uh, saying that they hope to raise enough money to fix a downstairs bedroom with an additional wet room attached and raise the level in the garden to make it easier for Louis to move from the home to the garden in his wheelchair. By sharing their story and with the involvement of the Hollywood duo, Charlotte and Aaron hope to show their experience is not a unique case. There's so many families with either half-finished builds or they've not started building at all and they're selling up or having to work, give up work to care for their disabled children as they cannot access funding. Uh, that's a quote from uh, Aaron, who's Louis' dad. So for my Hero of the Week, I'm giving a big, old, heartwarming love in and going for Rob and Ryan and Louis' parents, Aaron and Charlotte. Oh, this 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 anecdote's also made me really want to watch Welcome to Wrexham because I I don't watch it, but funny enough, my it's very good. My husband watches it, and it's always really funny when I walk into the living room while he's watching it, and there'll be a moment he's like, "I'm not crying, I'm not crying." <laughs> it's like, oh, I see. This is like man's rom com, you know. When I stay home and cry and eat my chocolates because I'm watching yeah. Jennifer Lopez not find her true love. The, oh, that's what Welcome to Wrexham is for dudes. I get it now. I get it. Um, there was a lot of love for last week's guest, Scottish First Minister Hamza Youssef. Aranal Alas on YouTube said, am I dreaming or did a, I just listen to a politician actually answer questions for 45 minutes? And look, if you missed it, um, you can listen back to last week's episode and interview with Hamza Youssef by finding it on our feed. It's well worth your time. You can get in touch with us by emailing psuk at reducelistening.co.uk. It's always nice to hear your voices. So do send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514 644572. Internationally, that's plus four four seven five one four six four four five seven two. Don't forget to follow at Pod Save the UK on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find us on YouTube for access to full episodes and other exclusive content. And if you like, you can drop us a review too. Be nice though, we're extremely sensitive. And also I'm in New York, so don't spoil my business trip. <laughs> uh, Pod Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by Will Darkin and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer, David Dargahi. The executive producers are Anishka Sharma, Dan Jackson and Madeline Harringer with additional support from Ari Schwartz. Remember to hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Amazon, Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. And listen, for the people watching on YouTube, do the thumbs up, Nish. Come on. No. This is a party... <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I don't know if they're going to have left this in the edit, but we've discovered because on the video do one, conferencing do one, software do one. that we're using, it, it does weird little animations. <laughs> and, that, and it is doing one now. <laughs> I do a thumbs up and a little bubble has appeared with a drawing of a thumbs up in it. Excellent. And uh, at various points <laughs> earlier when we were trying to have a serious planning chat, I used the word party and balloons appeared. So it... it, it, it the video conferencing software is not without its challenges, but they're just not the ones you think. <laughs> Actually, it's been a very smooth process, but occasionally balloons come out of my head. 